Hello brothers and sisters, welcome to the second week of Lent. Are you excited with your Lenten journey this far? I hope you're finding delight in prayer, in the Word of God, in the fasting, and in the charity, and especially in spreading the living Word of God and being an active agent of His kingdom. Our readings today are from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, and Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, 17, from verse 1 to verse 9. So, the first reading of today, from Genesis, chapter 12, involves God's call of Abraham to become the spiritual father of his people. The appearance of Abraham in history marked a new era. It was in the 75th year of Abraham's life when God intervened in the course of history, reshaping his future to embrace his divine plan of salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Lord called Abraham to take his relatives and depart from his country and his father's house. From there, all of them together would journey to the land that the Lord will show them through Abraham. Much later, God would ask Moses to take the Jews from Egypt into a promised new land. And well, Jesus himself, he too, would have to leave his family back in Nazareth and begin his mission out on the road. And on one occasion, Jesus would remark that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And when he was crucified and he died, they brought him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb that was not even his own. My dear brothers and sisters, one of the hardest things that people face in life is not having a home to call their own. A family that they can call their own. A space that they can call their own. Many people today experience homelessness. Lots of people, young kids, hanging out on the streets, just this evening, I was speaking with a brother priest and we were talking about the kids who are hanging around some of these spots that are just not safe for them. And these are kids in their teens. And then many of them end up becoming gang members, cultists, because they are looking for family. They are looking for someone to belong to. They are looking for a home that they feel they never had or they never have with their parents. That is, if they even know their fathers at all or if their mothers are even around or able to fend for themselves. A great deal of the trouble in our schools come from the countless number of children within those schools that have no place they can really call their home or family that they can truly call their own, except perhaps the, the gangs that they hang out with that have accepted them as one of their own. breaks my heart. And this season of Lent, my thoughts and my prayers go to them. And I hope you remember them too. I hope we don't just condemn these children. I hope we don't just look down on them and say, what a bunch of uh, wayward kids who don't have a future. There are many of these kids who will delight and desire a future that is great and full of promise. 
but they just don't have a home. They just don't have a home. From the first reading, we learn, brothers and sisters, that it was not Abraham who took the initiative of talking to God. Instead, it was God who reached out to Abraham. In the same way, when we were called to become Christians, it was not through our own initiative. Instead, it was the grace of God that was manifested in us first. We didn't choose him. He chose us. He chose us. Abraham's call entails first that he completely disassociate himself from his pagan past. And second, he was requested to migrate to a land of God's choosing. Equally, when you and I accepted Jesus Christ into our lives through faith and we received the sacrament of baptism, we were also called to detach ourselves from our past. No wonder 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, So whoever is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. Responding to God's call at the age of 75, Abraham and his relatives departed Haran. Abraham did not say, Oh dear God, can you just wait a bit more, probably for a week or a few months because you know I'm an old man now and I'm getting really tired? And Abraham did not say either, Lord, I'm too old now to start traveling blindly, not knowing exactly where I am going. Well, just as the Virgin Mary gave her fiat unconditionally to the angel of the Lord, without taking into consideration the consequences of what she was embracing, so too, Abraham gave his fiat to God unconditionally. These models of perfect fiats remind us that we too should not delay our commitment to Jesus Christ. We should not delay our admission into the body of Christ through the sacrament of baptism, nor should we delay our obligation to receive the sacraments of the Holy Eucharist and of penance on a regular basis to maintain our righteousness with God. Because we do not know the moment, the moment when the breath of life will be taken away from us. So now that that call is resounding in our hearts, like Abraham, we've got to up and follow. Like Mary, we've got to say, yes, let it be done to me according to the word that is resounding in my heart. Today's second reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy is a reminder that God calls each and every one of us. And God wants us to become holy, reminding us that we have received our life and immortality through the good news of Jesus Christ. And in today's gospel reading, we heard that in the company of Peter, James, and his brother John, Jesus was transfigured on a high mountain. But what exactly was the purpose of this transfiguration? Three things could come to mind. First of all, when God spoke from heaven as he had spoken during the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, the sonship of Jesus 
was being revealed to those who were present on the mountain. It was being confirmed to those who were present on the mountain. Secondly, when the face of Jesus shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white, the event may have testified to the fact that the Lord Jesus was the true light that enlightens everyone that John chapter 1 verse 9 talks about. And thirdly, the transfiguration may have foreshadowed the eternal reign of Jesus as God and as King in heaven. The book of Revelation tells us in Revelation chapter 22 verse 5, Night will be no more, nor will they need light from lamp or sun, for the Lord God shall give them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 says, Now this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And when Moses and Elijah appeared, they were having a conversation with Jesus. It's amazing how these great figures who had long died and been buried were back on the mountain with Jesus and the apostles could recognize them. They knew who they were. That is so refreshing. It's so consoling that our loved ones who have gone before us marked with a sign of faith, we'll see them one day and we're going to recognize them. We're going to know them. They're going to have the same features that they had. Oh yes. And what a beautiful gathering that will be. You know, one of the great lessons I really love about this passage is that Jesus loved to communicate with his Father. So he made time to commune with him on a daily basis through prayer. Jesus prayed not because he could not do anything without prayer, but because he wanted to teach us the need for total dependence on the one who sent him. He went on that mountain and he was in prayer. He was in prayer. We are not told that he was praying with the apostles. And we're not told that the apostles were praying either. But Jesus was in prayer. Jesus showed that the Father is the source of his power. And without him, his ministry on earth could not be successful. What Jesus did shows that he acknowledged the Father to be the sustainer of his ministry. And that is why, even in his busy schedules, he will make time to meet privately with his Father. Hear me, church, and hear me well. There are many Christian ministers and lay members of the body of Christ, the church, who, though they believe God to be their source of life, the source of their wealth, and their ministry, they do not make enough time to pray privately. They participate in almost every public prayer session. They even pray for many people in public, but they do not make time to pray privately. When we refuse to pray privately, dear friends, we destroy our relationship with the Father. Even though public prayer is important, private prayer is more effective when it comes to our personal relationship with the Father. Every believer, every believer should understand that God is the source and sustainer of all life. Without him, we are cut off from the source of life. Remember Jesus saying of the vine and the branches in John chapter 15, that cut off from him, we can do nothing. We can be better connected to God and to the true vine 
through effective and consistent prayers. Any Christian who fails to pray disconnects himself from the source of power for believers. Apart from Jesus teaching us about the need to pray and get connected to God, the story of his transfiguration also teaches us to know that when we are connected to God, when we are intimate with him, we reflect the glory of the Father. According to Luke's account, the appearance of Jesus' face changed as he was praying and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. This means that prayer does not only change things, but prayer changes the person who prays. Prayer does not only change things, prayer changes the person who prays. Prayer makes that person to reflect the glory of God. Through prayer, we are connected to the real source of our existence and eventually we reflect the glorious image of God. Is that not a joyful thing? Is it not a beautiful thing? Those who refuse to connect to God through fervent and consistent prayer of faith, they're missing out on a great deal. The truth, my brothers and sisters, is that those who pray consistently experience an inner peace and joy which emanates from God. This peace and joy permeates every aspect of a person's life and eventually translates into his physical appearance. The sick person who prays overcomes the pain and psychological trauma which can affect his or her facial appearance and physical strength negatively. Oh yes, the person, the sick person who prays by connection to the source of power, we be transformed through prayer. Those who worry about almost everything in life are more likely to develop health problems and even grow more wrinkles than those who worry less. The Bible teaches us that those who hope in the Lord, who wait on Him, will renew their strength. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. He says, They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. It is true prayer that one's hope in the Lord is renewed and deepened. And that is why, my brothers and sisters, it is my prayer that believers will acknowledge the positive impact of prayer on one's physical and spiritual condition so that we may be encouraged to uh, make prayer a consistent habit. Prayer should not be offered only in times of difficulty. Prayer should form an integral part of our whole lives because it solidifies our relationship with the Lord God Almighty and transforms us into better and better images of God's likeness and glory. Dear God and Father, draw us so deep into you through prayer that we become totally like you, that we may shine your glory for all to see. Father, anything in us that deprives us of loving and enjoying intimate relationship with you through prayer. Let it be far removed from us. Let it be excised completely from our lives so that we may become everything you created us to be through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.